I dream for all of us to own wardrobes with garments made from sustainable sources, including fair wages for the makers. I aim to motivate and inspire viewers to see the clothes they wear as an expression of their personality and their beliefs. This is the Slow Wardrobe. Come and have a look. Welcome to episode 18 of the Slow Wardrobe podcast. My name is Linda and I'm your host. For those of you who don't know me, I am the curator of the Slow Wardrobe, my own little tiny corner of the garment and woolly world. I will uh, fill this episode this time again with a combination of different subjects. I apologize in advance for the strange kind of light, uh, which is artificial. The uh, us usual recordings, I try and use uh, daylight from a window that's right next to me here. But it's gone really dark outside with some horrific weather. So the any cars passing are going to be quite loud because they're splashing through the water. So I apologize for that in advance. Hopefully it's not going to be too disruptive. Um, at least there are still less cars than usual because of the enduring lockdown. I hope you're coping with it as well. You can and I hope to give you a little bit of uh, light relief with this episode if I can. In this particular episode, I'm going to talk a little bit again about uh, mending garments and mending knitting, for example, as well as um, a, a, a tiny unpacking session of a make, do and mend kit that um, I've just added to the website. I devised these kits actually a couple of years ago but never really saw an opportunity to promote them. I had them with me at Edinburgh Yarn Fest and people were a little bit confused about them because I don't think I was really doing them justice on our tiny stand there. But now seems a very opportune time. The sales, uh, like I said in a previous episode of the darning uh, wool that I sell and things like darning mushrooms have gone absolutely through the roof. So my guess is that there will be some people who could really use the contents of a kit like this, which I will uh, reveal in a little bit. So a bit about making do and mending. I'm showing in some cases re-showing some mends that I have done myself in uh, garments and, and knitting that I have uh, around the house that I've brought in. And then following that are um, responses to some customer requests. One is showing you how to tie up the Hilo bloomers. They can be tied up in different ways and I'll show that to you in detail in a little segment. Following that is a segment showing what kind of shoes and boots to wear with layer cake outfits. And I was a little bit nonplussed by the request because layer cake can be taken in so many different directions in terms of the, st the way you style it and the kind of garments that you wear it with. So I hope I have done that question justice with the boots and shoes that I'll be showing later on in the episode. And I've tried to make that segment really fun. Bit of an editing nightmare, you'll see what I mean. But hopefully it all comes together and uh, and it all makes sense to you. As usual, please let me know what you think about it after you've seen the episode. And I will try and uh, tag at what specific, I'll do that down here now, tag at what specific timings the different segments uh, end and uh, start. So if you want to see the high-low bloomer tying, that starts right there. And if you want to uh, scrub ahead to the um, layer cake shoes and boots segment rather than listening to me going on about making, do and mending, then scrub do the, um, the uh, time tag that is shown down here. Without further ado, a little bit more about making, do and mending. I'm actually sitting in front of a coat that is my husband's. 
It's a, quite a traditional cold coat called a covert coat. And um, he managed within weeks of first getting it a couple of years ago, he managed to get a little hole in one of the sleeves. And he immediately saw an opportunity to ask me to do a visible mend on it. And he loves wearing this little uh, silk hanky in his uh, breast pocket of this coat. And of course, the main color of that is a dark maroon color. So he asked me if maybe the visible men's could be done in a color like that. Well, with 96 colors of the Sajou La Saint-Pierre, which is its official name, darning wool that I have, it was not very difficult to find the right kind of maroon. So what I did rather than try and disguise the mend is do a visible mend. You'll see it from a distance on the sleeve here. It just looks like a little blobby, a little a little uh, polka dot for want of a better word. I'll show you a close up of it now. That's the close up of it. And that's really the only mend that this coat needed. But uh, he liked it so much that he asked me to do some more of those kind of details on the coat, which I have. Um, I don't know whether you can see it, I, but I'll show you close ups as well. It's got another little star like mend on the sleeve, this sleeve here. And it's got a similar kind of fake really mend on the lapel here and it's got something similar to that in the back of the lapel as well so that little accent color is coming back in a couple of different places now before i move on there's actually something very interesting that i very recently learned about covert coats that i've never known before both the bottom of the sleeves of this coat as well as the bottom hem feels quite heavy and thick and reinforced, heavier than the rest. It's like it has some extra interfacing. And then it has four seams all at one centimeter intervals. And um, I was told, I was ex it was explained to me that those exist because these coats were worn out in the field for uh, hunting and farming type activities and they would be worn for years. It's a very hard wearing fabric. It lasts very long. It just doesn't like fire, which is how that first little hole appeared. That was fireworks. So the idea behind these seams is that when the edge of the sleeve starts fraying, you cut a little bit off the sleeve to the next uh, top stitching line and then you can wear it again with a proper sleeve until it frays any further. And you can do that with the sleeves and you can do that with the bottom of the coat. It's a very old fashioned way of trying to make the garments last without having to do any uh, additional mending on the part of the, the wearer, which I think is such a cool bit of uh, historic information. Anyway, so that's his covert coat. And I will also show you uh, one of his jackets, which I mended uh, due to a moth infestation that we had in the house a while ago. We haven't had anything serious since, thank goodness, but this was quite a serious moth infestation and they ended up getting into the hallway cabinet and went to town on this jacket. Of course, this happened in summer. Spring and summer are the uh, prime times for moth infestations. So they come from outside and then wreak havoc with your woolens. This is a tweed jacket and you can see, again, a splodgy kind of dark point there. Again, I'll show you a close up of it now. And again, the intention with this mend was to make it a visible mend. So there is a little bit of weaving in the middle of it and then little bits around to try and pick up and uh, attach or, or catch loose fibers to ensure that there's no way that it will fray any further. It also has similar things going on at the lapel 
and on one or two places on the sleeves, which I'll show you as well in close up. This is hands down the jacket that he gets the most reactions on and compliments about. And people seem to love the fact that it is visibly, but quite subtly vis vis visibly mended. What I haven't done yet and what I'd love to do is a big visible mend on a plain fabric where the mend has some kind of tweeding about it. So coloured lines rather than having solid lines on a tweedy fabric, do the other way around and have a tweedy mend on a solid fabric. I love that kind of embellishment. My problem is <laughs> not enough time, isn't it? All of our problems and... Um, with the um, virus lockdown, the available time that I have doesn't seem to have improved at all because, yes, the shows have fallen away, but of course I've tried to step up the uh, recording schedule of the podcast as well as sending out regular newsletter to keep in touch with you all. So uh, as a result, I seem to be busier than ever. I can't imagine ever saying that I would be bored or that I've got too much time on my hands. I wish. I don't think it is to be. Still, I love what I do, so this is not a complaint. If I'm staying with tweed mens, then I'll also show you one of my play suits. And it's my wool play suit. The large Czech Scottish wool that I have. I love it to bits. And I managed to snag the pocket, one of the bottom pockets, when I was building a stand at a show. And I could have actually just re-sewn it. Nothing tore. It was just... A little, a little seam getting undone and I thought you know what this gives me an opportunity to do a visible mend that might look really interesting and gives a good example of what visible mends can look like on a garment so rather than hiding it I have emphasized it as much as I can so as you can see here this is the bottom of the play suit See the two pockets and then, and the zip. And then here, where the pocket corner, where that, that little seam there went, I've covered it with a square of the wool fabric and then did lots of visible stitching. Again, I'll show you a close up of it now. Lots of visible stitching on top to highlight and emphasize what has happened there and that it's an extra patch. It's the only patch on this play suit, it doesn't have anything else and I love how it stands out and how it emphasizes that something went wrong there and it's been it's been picked up and corrected. Talking about going wrong, my first ever play suit, so this was one of the prototypes, this is when we were still working out how to best make them. We started with a zip in the side seam, which of course meant that you still had to take the whole thing off. This was before we came up with the idea of putting in a bottom seam, a bottom zip. So um, we were experimenting with it and where and how that zip would have to open to make it easy to get in and out of the thing. But you basically ended up with a garment that you had to lift over your head to get out of one side and halfway through the experimentation we'd made a couple of prototypes one of this was this one I came up with the idea of putting the zip in the bottom and the rest is history now this fabric it's our older steel colored fabric it's not a cross weave yet this is before we moved into the cross weaves and um, I uh, readily admit not the world's best cook and I don't actually enjoy cooking much to be honest my husband loves it so I'm very lucky in that respect I love eating it but I do not like preparing it I have a chef as a sister-in-law 
and a keen to cook husband. So thank, thank goodness for that. But I'm not keen. I'm not that great at it either. And that was very clear one day when I was making something, whipping up quickly a meal in the kitchen and I splashed some oil all over this play suit and I wasn't able to get rid of oil, all the oil stains. I have some pretty good stain removers, some Dutch stuff called green soap. It's fantastic. But, and it, it really was nearly, nearly gone, but still, because you have the, the large swathe of plain mid-gray fabric, I could still see where those stains had been and it bothered me senseless. I was just coming up with the idea of doing visible mending and saw a big plain canvas in this play suit. So I did a large amount of very subtle embroidery on it. Again, I'll show you a proper close up of the whole garment. But what it has is a series of embroidery of very subtle flower heads and long, long stems that go all the way to the bottom. So they start at about the midriff and then there are a lot shorter ones as well, as you can see, and then with long stems to the bottom, all done in the same darning wool. And it's the kind of wool that uh, can be washed. There is some nylon in it as well, so it's very hard wearing. And I love the fact that the wool is slightly soft and fuzzy. And of course, the linen is quite uh, cool and smooth. And I chose a very subtle color on purpose. This was my first foray into this kind of embroidery. So I wanted to see what it was like. And um, this was also really the uh, the first bit of inspiration to do a kit to inspire all of you to visibly mend your layer cakes as well. Before we get to it, a couple of last mends of knitted fabrics, because what I've shown you so far were all woven fabrics. And uh, the kit has got a content that you can either stitch with or um, use on knitted fabric. Hair in my mouth. I brought with me a pair of socks, of my husband's socks. They are well worn and I have darned them quite extensively. This is the top of one sock and here's the bottom. And there are darns in just plain grey underneath the sock, both at the toe section as well as the heels. And when I grabbed these in order to show you, I saw that one of the darning areas has been almost completely destroyed again by wearing it lots. I'll show you a close up of it now. So that was a big patch of darning. And the bottom half of it is nearly gone. So I would have to redo that. And this is the kind of darning that's called Swiss darning. It's where you copy the shape and the um, movement of the, the yarn through the stitches. So every darning stitch looks like a little knitting stitch. You follow the knitting stitches with the darning yarn rather than creating a woven grid over the top of the hole in your knitting. So that's darning on some socks. And I'm doing the same, the same kind of darning, the Swiss darning of tiny, tiny stitches on the cashmere wrap that I'm still in the process of darning with some pale gray yarn pale grey colour. Uh, again, it's the uh, Saju. In fact, this is the same colour as I used to embroider on the uh, steel play suit. And you can see there's some big holes to come still. 
the plan is with the bigger holes to copy the knitting and actually re-knit a little area that is completely gone with some of the tiniest needles that I have. I have a vague memory that I've told you that before already as well and I would have loved to have shown you but I still have gotten to it. Poor man keeps waiting for his wrap and now of course we're coming out of winter so I guess that's bought me some more time. Last one I want to show you is a jumper of one of my boys. It is a lovely woolly jumper, very fine woolen jumper. And this is an example where I didn't go for Swiss darning, but it is a woven tiny little yellow patch. Again, both of my sons request visible mending rather than invisible. And a tiny little woven patch in the middle and then catching the loose stitches that could potentially ladder up and down the, in this case, shoulder and making sure that they are secured. So this jumper at the moment has got two little patches like that. There's another one in the side seam. I'll show you an up close of that as well. And it's got a couple of new little holes. I was informed this morning, so I hope we don't have any more moths, but it will be receiving a couple more visible repairs, this jumper. Right, enough of the make, do and mend show as far as I've been able to in the uh, past number of months. And let me show you what the content is of one of these make, do and mend kits. The idea is that it has got some stuff in it that can be used for sewing mending, including some fabric, it's got some embroidery bits and it's got some wool and woolly bits in there as well. There is a list of everything that's in there on the back. I'll show you the list up close now and then I'll go through that with you in detail. It's got a, a lovely little tin, keepsake tin, with um, uh, a perspex or a uh, plastic type lid so this is not glass it will not shatter it's a safe lid and then when you open it up all the bits are in there so starting from the top there are six hands hanks of a Swedish brand called Lindblomman and these are embroidery threads that are 100% linen they are very very old I think they were originally produced in the 60s and or 70s and I met the lady who sells these at one of the knitting and stitching shows a couple of years ago and I bought some of the colors that I really liked and that she had enough stock of to sell me and that's what's in these kits they're very limited I think I only have eight or nine of these kits in total with this particular content and after that the content of the tins will change change I will keep doing tins but they will not have exactly this content so there's only like I said eight or nine of these available so six colors of very very unique linen embroidery thread here is a lovely little strawberry shaped pin cushion then moving on I'll put the tin down I don't have to hold it in front of my face then we move on to a traditional darning mushroom like this you can either keep taking it apart for storage you can push it in there quite firmly and it will stay so it won't come apart on your project but if you don't want it to be able to come apart then you put a drop of super glue on it stick it in place and you'll have this shape for good. I quite find it quite handy actually that you can take it apart. So there's your darning mushroom. Then there are two sets of needles in there. They are both sets by Saju, the same brand as the darning yarns. One is a set that is sturdy and thicker 
both sets have pointy needles, so they're not blunt, they're both pointy needles. And showing them up close, you can see the difference. These are the sturdy needles in the little gray packet. And then the needles in the more decorated packet are long and thin. They also have a smaller eye. I specifically chose these needles because they go extremely well with the idea of embroidering either the wool or the linen onto fabric or onto knitted garments. And most people already have some darning needles that are blunt. So these are two sets of very sharp needles. Then moving on to the woolen thread, what I've put in there are real proper basic classic colors, black, gray, navy and red, so that you can either go for a contrast or go for an invisible mend, but they're bound to be colors that you can use. And of course, if you want other colors to supplement, I've got lots. Having said that, Saju doesn't um, at the moment ship from France. So I'm starting to run out of colors that at the moment I cannot replace. But most colors, I think one, two, three, there's only four colors out of the 96 that I don't have any of at the moment. So we're not doing badly. So four colors of darning wool. Then there is a little bag with 20 bulb safety pins in it. I'll show some bulb safety pins up close rather than trying to show it here. And uh, the idea with bulb safety pins is that they can't snag any fabric, whether it's woven or especially woolen fabric. A normal safety pin which has got that extra loop at the bottom, that loop can easily snag things and these don't. So bulb shaped safety pins. Then a little roll of layer cake linen. It's a number of pieces of linen that you can use to do patches on your existing linens. And every box has got at least one piece of the gingham, the black gingham in there. And that is specifically for a reason. I'll come to that in a minute. So a nice little set of pieces of fabric for you to do visible mends with. And then a nice and compact size of fabric scissors. So a lot of people have tiny little snips and scissors for their yarns, but these are proper fabric scissors. They're not huge. So if you are big on fabric cutting, then you probably want bigger scissors as well. But for the occasional fabric cutter and the occasional sewer, sewer or sewist, I don't know exactly what the right word is, then these will be fine. They are a very good brand. They're by Ernest Wright. So they are expensive scissors and that's what boosts the price of this kit quite a lot. But they're really worth the investment. They're great scissors and Ernest Wright gives wonderful service on their scissors as well. Then Coming right to the end, there is a set of four different embroidery designs in there that are specifically graphed, so on graph paper, that has the right size to copy the size of the little squares on the black gingham. So this is specifically to be embroidered on black gingham or for those of you who are more confident and don't need a grid like the black gingham fabric gives you of course these designs could also be embroidered on a plain linen and you can either visually copy them or you can trace them onto the linen fabric with erasable pens or pencils I haven't put those in here because that all gets a little bit more involved and I want it to be a a good starter kit. So um, they're all designs of different flowers and plants and hopefully you can do something with them. And that's it. That's all in the kit. They're available on the website. Go and have a look. If you have any questions about them, give me a shout. And that's it for the first section. 
let's get on now with looking at high-low trousers followed by shoes and boots to wear with your layer cake. So I'm wearing a pair of the full-length high-lows, the long-length high-lows, which are full length on me, and I have tied the ties that you normally use to make them shorter in a bow on the inside. Look, you can see the bow there so that the ends don't hang out at the bottom when you're wearing them full length. And they're a nice billowy shape when you wear them full length, but it also offers these opportunities to tie them up. Now, what I'm doing at the moment is at the bottom, in the hem of the trouser, along the both of the uh, side seams, inside and outside, is a buttonhole. So I'm taking one tie and tying it, pulling it through the buttonhole, and then tying the ties into a bow. So that effectively pulls the bottom of the trouser in and folds it over by about four inches. Here goes the second tie through the buttonhole at the bottom of the outside seam of the trouser. Pull it all the way up, then make a bow. And then when you straighten that leg, then you can see that both on the inside and the outside, the bottom hem has been pulled up and folded over effectively into this, this blousy kind of bloomer effect. So that shortens the trouser by about four inches and it gives you an opportunity to show off whatever shoes or boots you're wearing. I will now on the other leg show the second way of tying them up. You again start with putting one tie through the but but buttonhole. My goodness, why is this such a difficult word? <laughs> So through the buttonhole first, always, because that keeps the fabric in the right position. Then you go through the buttonhole on the tab that's a little bit further up on the outside of the trousers. There's a tab on the inside of the leg and the outside of the leg. You'll see that when I turn in a minute. See, and then you get a crumpled effect rather than just fold it, it crumples. Look, there's the tie on the other uh, the tab on the other side. So again, you go through the buttonhole first. I'm learning to say the word buttonhole in the process of this voiceover. That's useful. So you go through the buttonhole first, then you find the buttonhole in the tab. There it is. Go through the tab. You all, only do all of that with one of the two ties. The other one just hangs there until it's time to make uh, a bow, pull it all the way through, tighten it all the way, then make your bow, and then you'll be able to see the difference between the left and the right leg. It's not a lot shorter in the front and back, but in the side, it pulls up the trouser leg that little bit extra. See, on my left leg, you can't see any leg. On the right leg, you can with that extra tie up. And there you have it tie-up of the high-lows. To make this section interesting for everybody, of course I'm not just going to talk shoes and boots, but I'm playing around with my outfits as well. This is a wintry outfit. I'm just showing you that I've got a pair of leggings underneath my play suit, which is a great option for winter wear. Then I'm wearing a long sleeve t-shirt underneath my uh, play suit and my smock. And then over the top of that, a kimono cardigan. And I'm wearing, as you can see, the Trinity Twist shrug as a scarf. The color of the shrug is the same as the color I've used in the kimono cardigan. So it's a nice combination. And I'm wearing it with Doc Martens, which is a surefire success for wearing layer cakes. And everybody's familiar with those. Change there, surprise, surprise, to the shorter play suit. 
So I was wearing the full length play suit and here I'm wearing the, the regular length which is slightly cropped on me and it's a lovely way to show off ankle boots like I am there. Moving on again to another boot style that works really well. This is an UGG style boot, which of course in the lockdown is wonderful to bum around in at home. And again, showing them off with a medium length, working really well. Changing them there up to um, a boot that is a little bit taller, still in the cropped play suit, as you can see and a boot with a little bit of a heel. Works extremely well too. It's still relaxed, but slightly more formal. I've changed there the regular length play suit to a long on me length dress. Again, working great with the boots. A medium size heel about two inches high. Now I've swapped the dress for a shorter one, still with the same boots, still with the leggings, and I've dropped the cardigan, but another relaxed look. And again, if your boots don't completely cover the part of the leg that you see with your layer cake outfit, that can look great with leggings or with tight jeans, for example. And I've uh, dropped the dress here as well, and just wearing initially a smock, and now changing it up for a tabard. Some people like the idea of having points in the front and back better. As you can see, it really emphasizes the length of your legs, especially if you wear boots that are a bit taller with a little bit of a heel on them. Going back down, literally, without any heels to a very relaxed laid back look by wearing some trainers. If your trainers are more like sneakers, so they don't look too much like workout shoes, then that works fantastic with layer cakes too, all kinds of layer cakes. To emphasize that, I've added here a pair of baggies with the sneakers popping out underneath. And it's a bit like wearing docks, but uh, these kind of high top sneakers work fantastic with um, any kind of layer cakes, but I specifically love the look with having them peep out from under the baggies. Same would look would be achieved if you'd wear them, for example, with uh, the high lows. Meanwhile, we're moving more towards a spring-like look. I've taken that heavier scarf that was made up by the shrug off and I'm replacing it with one of my dumbboard scarves in the latest color combination that I've finished knitting. So back to the brighter colored smock here. Same look still, haven't changed my shoes. I just wanted to change up the, the top part of my outfit, but we're about to go for another shoe change. And here it is. These are actually a uh, type of cowboy boot, a short cowboy boot, but the length of them is not that important. It shows you a completely different boot style that actually also looks great with a layer cake outfit. I'm trying to show you that it really doesn't matter. Almost any kind of shoe style goes. So changing it up further towards springtime, changing to a very flat ballet sh style shoe together with leggings and a smock. And of course you could add something like the dress here as well if you wouldn't like to show just as much leg. But again, a very relaxed look and lovely warmer spring days, here we come. I've changed the ballet shoes there for a clog style shoe. This is the closest to a clog I have. I'm not very good at wearing clogs kind of funny coming from Holland, but clogs work extremely well with layer cakes as well. Changed it back here to the cropped play suit to show what that's like. And here we have um, a, another flat style shoe, not quite a ballet shoe, but showing that just any kind of flat shoe works. Here's the ballet flats, flats again to show those with the, the play suit. Ballet flats are one of my favorite shoes in the summer. 
And here we are in summer with a longer play suit, the ballet flats, and then just covering my shoulders with the trellis shawlette. Going back to those pink closed shoes, lovely to wear a neutral colour in summer because it really puts the emphasis on the garment. <gasps> What's happened here? An extra garment. Have we ever seen that before? I can reveal to you now that this is actually going to be a layer cake in colour number two. Coming to you soon. Sneak peek. Back in summer without any secret garments, showing you that in the summertime it's lovely to wear the play suit loose and open as well, especially if it's very warm. If even the play suit is too warm and you need something shorter, then here's one of the dresses, pretending it to be very, very warm there. And you can even go down in the size of your shoes by wearing just a pair of simple slippers. The slippers that I'm wearing there, the open toe sandals, I should call them really, have a nice contrast flower on them. And to bring that back in the styling of the outfit, however simple, I'm taking that bright pink and bringing it back with the uh, little dumbboard scarf around my neck. So it's a very simple and effective high summer outfit. If you find that all a little bit too much and you want to add an extra layer back in, then here's the same outfit with a pair of baggies, all in charcoal. But hang on, an idea. Yes! I like that purple smock with this outfit. It's so summery and bright and really cheerful. Oh, I can feel another one coming on. Of course, the little shrug, the Trinity shrug, would be a lovely extra layer without adding any warmth onto your arms. So I was wearing it there with the panel on the front, but you can turn it around as well and turn it into a tiny little extra layer of warmth on your neck and back by wearing it the other way around and tying it in the front creates a lovely silhouette and a lovely outfit without making your entire outfit much warmer. And of course you knit this to fit you. The instructions are on the pattern. Here we have some heels finally making it to the lineup. I don't have a lot of heels, but I'm showing you here that heels look fantastic as well with layer cakes. And I have uh, called in the help of one of my friends. I've got some lovely pictures lined up, but oh, there, there's another idea. I had my eye on that lovely big rippled sand shawl knitted out of yak silk too and blend it with soliloquy. A lovely extra layer when it gets cooler in the evening. Oh, remember! Remember the tied up high-low bloomers? That's what they would look like with a pair of heels that really deserve being shown off. Now, I'm very aware that these heels are not very summery, so we can do something about that as well in a minute. But before we get to that, I wanted to show you what the bloomers tied up look like with a dress over the top. They almost work like petticoats. I really like that idea. Here's the shorter dress. If you want to show up a little bit more of your high-low bloomers, then of course you can go for a shorter dress. And if you normally already wear the regular length dress, then of course you can create this effect by wearing a smock or a tabard instead and thereby you end up showing more of the bottom of the bloomers. I'm going to release the ties of the bloomers here to show you what the high-low bloomers look like worn with high heels and worn down rather than tied up. It's a look that I enjoy a lot as well and uh, it really shows off the shape of the, the billowy shape of the lower half of the legs of the bloomers. 
there we go see you get that that lantern kind of shape that's really being shown and here we are back to the longer dress same trousers so you see less of the lantern shape because the dress covers more of it but a very nice and sophisticated look oh now there's an idea for a more summery look as you can see less bulky than the rippled sand and really nice and flowy and airy but still covering your arms and creating a lovely color impact this is the fairly xl in a large linen gradient set changing over to a more summery shoe these are peep toes they are closed around the side and back and they have a very high heel. They're actually relatively comfortable to wear considering how high they are. And I've chosen them because I wanted to show you that high heels, very high heels, whether they're open or closed, look just as good with layer cakes as very informal and more uh, chunky closed shoes do in winter. It really depends on the styling that you do of your layer cakes and what kind of shoes and boots go best with that. Meanwhile, I'm tying up the Fairly XL in a way that my shoulders and neck aren't covered as much so I could continue to wear it even if it were very warm. Back to the cropped play suit look here with the high heels and I'm about to show you a whole bunch of different styles of heels worn by my friend Sharon with baggies. From fringed high heeled booties to some really classic court shoes, even a pair of Louboutins, very bling looking gladiator sandals and very open high heeled sandals. These are Mobius slides and Last but not least, a pair of espadrille wedges tied in a very fashionable for this season look. So back I am in my play suit with my high heels with a very summery look. And there's one other thing that I wanted to add that I would probably be wearing if there were any festivals on this summer. And that would be my crop play suit with the Western boots. Super, super funky and super relaxed and great for stomping around fields at a festival. So that kind of wraps it up. I hope I've given you a good impression and I hope you've enjoyed this selection. See you again soon.